Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Disasters Deconstructed live stream. Um, I'm Jason Von Metting, and here with me today is my co-host. I have Liz Malley. Hey, welcome. Hello. Um, so first of all, sorry today that uh, Ksenia is not here. She actually has COVID. So we're sending her um, good wishes to get well soon. Um, but Liz and I will do our best in Ksenia's absence. Um, this is the second live stream to celebrate the 20th anniversary of IREC. So if you tuned in last week, um, we're really glad to see you again. Um, if not, you can catch the recording on YouTube. Um, but we're really excited to do the second session to celebrate this anniversary. And today's theme is tradition versus innovation, a discussion of post-disaster tension amidst global change. Um, it corresponds with the theme of the 2022 IREC student competition. And we're going to announce the winners of that competition a bit later on in the stream. So that's another exciting thing today. Um, but in advance of that, we are going to have a discussion about the theme with um, some speakers. And we're going to have a, a uh, opportunity for you all to ask questions of them. So to discuss this topic today, we have with us Osamu Tsukihashi, Yasuaki Onuda, and Giuseppe Farina. And um, as usual, on our live streams, you can engage by using the comment box um, on whatever platform you're watching on. Uh, and we're going to have time for questions later on. So first of all, let me tell you a bit about my co-host for the day, Liz. So, so Elizabeth Malley is an associate professor at the International Research Institute of Disaster Science, Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. Um, with the theme of people-centered housing recovery, her research interests are community-based housing recovery and provision methods of transitional and permanent housing within reconstruction processes, including policy process and housing forms that support successful life recovery for disaster-affected people. Her past and current research focuses on the experience of people affected by disaster and the roles of government and NGOs in the processes of housing reconstruction and resettlement after disasters in the USA, Indonesia, Philippines, and Japan. So I'm really excited, Liz, uh, to have you with your, here with us today. And thank you for hosting the session with me. So over to you to talk a bit about the theme. Oh, thank no, you, I Jason. I forgot to mention, Liz, that you're going to be one of the chairs for IREC when it is back um, in in person and in Japan. Yes, I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm sorry Ksenia's not here. I hope she's feeling better, but I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you um, today and to be part of this exciting discussion as a follow-up from last last session looking back. So today we're looking forward and specifically looking, hope, also looking forward to next year, um, we, we hope to see you in Japan. So I'm um, here in Sendai, Japan, which is the largest city in the area that was affected by the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. And along with other Japanese colleagues, uh, especially Dr. Tami Kondo and two of the participants today, we were planning to organize the first ever IREC in Japan in 2022. However, you can guess what happened um, uh, because we, we really wanted to invite everybody to come and gather in person. And as we talked about, if you joined the last last uh, webinar about looking back and about how meaningful it was to have the experiences of gathering in person and also interacting with local people and local communities, we decided to postpone our IREC, first IREC Japan conference until next year. Um, so we... The date hasn't been final date hasn't been decided yet, but it probably will be almost exactly one year from today, this week ish. So we're looking forward to uh, welcome you to to Japan in that time. So how so that's kind of the story about why I'm I'm here today with you. Um, but although we didn't we postponed the conference, the student competition still carried on, and so that's what uh, we're also here to discuss the theme of what became the student competition of uh, 2022. So we had a lot of really exciting entries and, and exciting uh, thoughtful entries, and we're gonna talk more about that today. So um, two of our, our 
participants from Japan are also really integral in organizing uh, what became, it's going to become 2023 conference and was all, we're also part of the jury. So um, without further ado, I want to get move along to the discussion. And so today we, we asked, our, we invited our guests, our, excuse me, our guests to reflect on the theme of the student competition this year, which is between tradition and innovation. And in particular, we asked, what must change and what mustn't in the face of climate change? What values are often opposed in processes of transformation or innovation after disasters? Why is change needed in the face of climate change and the ongoing destruction of ecosystems? And what kind of, what type of change is needed? Technological changes, changes in behavior, changes in practices, et cetera. So really simple, easy questions that <laughs> we, we can all answer so quickly, right? No, not so much, but um, so, I would like to, um, to, to respond to those questions, I would like to introduce our first uh, guest is Professor Osamu Tsukihashi, so from Kobe University. He's an architect and he and his group were awarded the prize of AIJ, the Architectural Institute of Japan, in 2015 for the Lost Homes Project, which is an activity in the affected towns and villages after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011. He is the director of Architects Tea House um, since 2003. And since 2009, he's been an associate professor at Kobe University. So not only practicing and researching architecture, urban design and placemaking, he's also producing media, editing and writing architectural discourse. And since 2022, he's a director of Kobe University Center for Resilient Design, CRESD. Um, so he's a very, a very important person who knows deeply about the field, a disaster affected area, both in Kobe and in Tohoku, and we're so happy to have him today. So, um, Osamu, please, <laughs> hello, <laughs> good to see Hi, you, hello. and uh, we, yeah, we're looking forward you. to hearing your feedback. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Liz and Jason. Uh, so I would like to comment on the uh, question about the competition. It's okay. So uh, this competition between tradition and innovation, we have several ways to think about it. Uh, answers will be different in a society that is hit by disasters and requires rapid recovery and in a society that must coexist with long-term climate change or disasters that occur repeatedly every year, tradition and innovation, change and unchanged are not in conflict with each other. They are always complicated with the challenges faced by each region. I think it is important for people working to solve the problem in that era. For example, students in this competition uh, to build a solution by associating the both tradition and innovation. Innovation is essential to us as we are constantly creating projects for the future. To create innovation, we must uh, we must train our imagination for the future. At the same time, we learn a lot from the past and the present. The imagination for society from the past to the present is just as important as that of the future. In this competition, each of the uh, 25 works was all powerful and I was greatly inspired and learned as an idea for creating a resilient society. I'd like to send a compliment of all the students who participated. Among them, the award-winning works have a deep understanding of the problems and unique resources of each region, tackle long-standing community traditions and courageous transformations for future. That with great imagination, it gave us a beautiful vision for the resilient future. By exchanging ideas for different regions in international competitions, we were able to get a deeper understanding of each regions. 
I think it is another great asset of participating in this competition. I think it is very important to continue this international competition platform in order to create a resilient world. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Muted myself. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Osama, for those reflections. Can you hear me? Um, okay. Our next reflection is from Yasuaki Onuda. And um, I'm going to do a, an introduction um, here. If I can. Sorry, I'm not on my usual setup. Dr. Onoda is a renowned uh, architectural planner in contemporary Japan. Um, and since he became a, uh, he became a well-known architect after his contribution to the Sendai MediaTek, a masterpiece of contemporary architecture designed by Toyo Ido in 2001. And he's created many valuable architectural projects um, through very challenging processes. Since the 311 disaster in 2011, Noda has been playing an important role as an organizer for reconstruction projects in disaster affected areas, as well as conducting critical research on the implications of recovery planning. Thanks so much, Yasuaki, for joining us. And uh, I'll go uh, to you now with those uh, same questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Could you hear me? We hear Oops. you okay. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I have to say to the student, uh, do you, uh, how can I say, uh, I mean the participant to the, this competition, the tons of efforts to achieve the, your excellent works. The frankly speaking, it's so tough work, you know, to select, uh, how can I say, best of five, number one, number two, number three. So I, I think uh, that we discussed uh, uh, to select uh, number one, number two, number three, and that kind of, you know, special <clears throat> award. But that I, in my opinion, it should be the sort of, you know, tentative the uh, decision to set up, uh, how can I say, uh, to see the future, to see the further the resiliency. It's a kind of, you know, keystone, I think. So, except uh, we selected the work, the works we selected, there are so many great works. So, please, the, uh, the student who are selected by uh, this award, please proud yourself, your achievement. And uh, the student, who, unfortunately, who are not the selected on the uh, this competition, uh, please keep going, okay? Uh, with uh, uh, your pride. Uh, I think that every, every works the, on this competition have uh, tons of you know, potential. So anyway, uh, I, I have to, I, I have to answer the, the questions. The question is so huge. So the, and also it's a very difficult, you know, to the answer, but the, let me try it. So first question is uh, what must change and what mustn't in the face of, you know, climate change? Hmm. I'm not sure. The, frankly speaking, I'm not sure uh, the, the 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 question mean by that. However, the fact uh, would be the, that the climate change should be once it cross cross a threshold, tend to accelerate until the next steadily the state. So it's a the, the, that's why it's very difficult, yeah. And the change is irreversible. So change never changed, okay. So the, therefore, the, the 
There is no time for war. <laughs> There is no time the struggling. Maybe we have to take uh, action to stop、uh, this kind of you know, changing you know, our tendencies. So, the, the, yeah, th this is uh, my uh, answer to、uh, first question. So, next one is、uh, what the value are、uh, often opposed in process of transformation or innovation after disaster? It's also a difficult question. I think that myself is a, the, the, the standing, have been standing、uh, a kind of in front person that since the disaster 2011 happened, I have been, I'm a person、uh, who have been standing,、uh, how can I say, until for, for reconstruction. Because our university is a core university of disaster affected areas. So, I, the, 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 from this the experience, I think the pride and the historical view often gets a way of change. But, b e a r e there are not the opposite e v e n t of change. In fact, they can even be the driving force. So, What's important, I believe, the how to move away from simplistic, how can I say, simplistic dualism, such as change or maintain, blah, blah, blah. Change or,、uh, how can I say, maintain. This kind of you know, dualism, simple dualism, might be, a, I guess, a opposed. The, That they are changing. So, this is my opinion. So, why is it changing?、Uh, okay. So, <laughs> maybe we, we, I don't have enough time. So, let me shift、uh, the final questions.、Uh, the type of change is needed.、Ah, what type of change is needed? What type of time change is needed? I think I avoid,、uh, how can I say, choosing the symbol dualism as I. Mentioned before, the how can I say,、uh, <clears throat> that and also we have mentioned that such kind of a simple dualism change or maintain, or how can I say, the tradition or change, maybe motivated by emotion or pride. So,、uh, I, I think,、uh, you know, to Get rid of you know, this kind of、uh, prejudgment. So, to get rid of this kind of prejudgment, we need,、uh, how can I say, the knowledge of science, not only, how can I say,、uh, nation, <coughs> not only,、uh, uh, how, how can I say,、uh, physical science, but also. The cultural science. So, this kind of you know, the matching, the physical science and the cultural science might be very important to get a little bit, you know, simplify the, the, the situation. So,、uh, <coughs> recently I published uh, the, this book, What Happened in、uh, Disaster, the After Disaster, and How Difficult. Uh, uh, good deconstruction works. So, but、uh, un unfortunately, these were all description in Japanese. So, maybe you know, I, I'm right now I'm struggling to、uh, translate from Japanese to English. So, maybe in the future, you can、uh, You have a sort of you know, opportunity to see、uh, this kind of you know, the, 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 this book in English version.、Now、anyway, so、uh, thanks again for your efforts. And、uh, I totally enjoy,、uh, I'm going to say, the, the, the selection. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Inoda. And、uh, really appreciate this, this invitation to. 
challenge the simple dualism that we uh, that are at risk of setting up between tra tra uh, tradition and innovation and challenging us to complicate our notion of yeah, yeah. Uh, this, yes. this problem. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I was wasting a lot of time, you know, speaking. <laughs> no, not, <laughs> not, at all. English. not at all. You, yeah. you, uh, you were very easy to understand. Um, thank okay. you. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you for touching up. Very important point. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. So our final reflection is from Giuseppe Farina. Um, hey, Giuseppe. <clears throat> Hello. Um, Dr. Frino is a lecturer in human geography at Bangor University in Wales, UK. He's an interdisciplinary human geographer with study and work experience in Italy, Australia, and the UK. He works at the intersection of disaster risk management, climate change adaptation, risk management, uh, oh, sorry, climate finance and development across Europe, Australia, Southeast Asia, and Ecuador. He was a co-chair of the last IREC in Florida, so many of you will know Giuseppe. Um, he's a dear friend of mine and is familiar to anyone that listens to Disasters Deconstructed. Welcome, Giuseppe. Really interested to hear your thoughts about this subject. Thank you, Jason. Uh, first of all, I hope you can hear me. So, um, and yeah, of course, I thank you. I thank the podcast, Disasters Deconstructed podcast. I also thank uh, um, Leeds. And uh, even also IVEC, uh, because of course this is this uh, you know this network uh, is being created under its uh, umbrella. Let's say. Um, first of all, I would like to join uh, Yasuaki in um, uh, you know in simulating students and in thanking them for participating at the competition, um, you know, and in and telling them to keep going, uh, particularly because I know that there's. Uh, uh, two and a half years have been very, very tough, in particular for students who struggled. Uh, some of them have struggled a lot. So uh, any achievement uh, you have reached in these two years uh, count uh, double or triple times, uh, you know, the, the, the time before the pandemic. So uh, thank you very much to, to all the students for participating and keep going with, the, uh, with your work. Um, I will try to respond to the $1 million questions that I have been asked to pose. Uh, I honestly don't have an answer and uh, I am afraid on the one side to be too generic and on the other side to be too simplistic for, uh, you know, to answering to such, uh, uh, you know, to, to provide an understanding of uh, such big challenges that uh, uh, we are confronting uh, right now. Um, so the, the the first question was what must change and what mustn't in in the face of climate change um i think that climate change led us to to think i mean climate change is now a global challenge so it's something that uh, unify let's say the world in uh, sort of finding a solution for uh, uh, for such a global challenge uh, however we should understand that climate change is not just an environmental challenge, but it's first of all a cultural, a social, and economical, and political challenge uh, that call uh, uh, all of us, all the countries, all the people to to work together to uh, to solve it. Um, unfortunately, those who are most powerful are not doing enough to uh, to solve uh, climate change because they are not intervening on this. Uh, uh, economic and political factors that might help to uh, reduce our personal, our, sorry, our collective contribution to climate change. Uh, so we still live in a, we continue to live in a, in a world that is dominated by a capitalist attitude of making profit for, uh, for everything and uh, marketizing you know, all natural and cultural resources that should be public and should be, uh, they don't have value actually. Uh, and they also don't challenge, uh, you know, the biggest profiteers of, of uh, our world. I think that this is something that we should reflect on when we think about climate, ch climate change as a political challenge and as an economic challenge. I would say that climate change is mainly a justice challenge because, uh, 
can I say, um, exacerbate the inequalities that uh, exist uh, in the world. So uh, again, it's clear that we should change some of our habits, some of our lifestyle. So it's clear that we must intervene on our individual and collective behavior uh, in terms of um, production, in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, mobilities, transportation, and so on. I also know that we should intervene a bit. Uh, we should intervene on the technological side. So having a better building, having uh, having a transportation ways that consume um, that are free for, from from fuel, um, and all these kind of things that uh, technological things that uh, tools sorry, that can help us in uh, reducing our climate foot. However, to do this, we first need to have a cultural change. And this cultural change, again, is thinking that there is another life uh, beyond our capitalist mode of organizing society. So we should desire something that goes beyond uh, profits and uh, fighting with each other and looking at the others like the enemies. So uh, humans are better than, uh, than we are now. So we should try to do better. I think this is the first. Uh, this is the first thing to do. Uh, I mean, to to face uh, such a global challenge. And of course, this also means ensuring social justice, environmental justice, uh, looking at uh, why is people vulnerable to to this, uh, to climate change and disasters, and how we can contribute to reduce. Uh, uh, vulnerability. So this is, this is the first step. In the most in the most specific case of in the more specific case of post disaster, uh, I think that again when we talk about post disaster and IRAC is a, a network about <clears throat> which is mainly born as a post disaster studies environment. Let's say uh, we should never normalize the fact that disaster happened. So. Unfortunately, with the capital society we live in, we have normalized the fact that disaster occur and that after a disaster, we should reconstruct in some ways. Uh, the rec reconstruction quite often go uh, not so well, let's say, and, uh, you know, temporary housing become permanent. Sometimes the reconstruction is a second disaster per se. So I don't want to go too much in detail in this because we don't have, uh, we don't have enough time. But anyway, we we need uh, social, cultural, and even economic investment in disaster risk reduction, not just in post disaster reconstruction. We know that uh, at the current state, most of the um, most of the governments and most of the international organization work uh, with a react reactive approach to disasters. However, we should work uh, in a more uh, proactive approaches to disasters. So we should, first of all, reduce risk. Uh, through social, cultural, economical, and uh, physical arrangements, but we should also avoid to create a disaster risk. And to avoid creating disaster risk, we should reflect on how our society is organized, how uh, the historical trajectory of society have had a repercussion today, and uh, uh, you know, try to change uh, our way of living, uh, of living on, in, in the world. Uh, again, I know that probably those are too generic responses that they are too simplistic because at the end, uh, you know, if you say, okay, we have to change the world, who, who has responsibility for doing it? Well, individually, we have our own responsibility. Collectively, we have our own responsibility, but let's never forget that there are more powerful forces that are economic forces, political forces, uh, governments, international organizations, those who make profit from from uh, from disasters those are the first accountable for uh, um you know for for let's say finding a solution uh however i don't think they are doing too much most of the most of the uh statement to reduce disaster fighting climate change they are rhetorical statement there are big meetings but at the end you know they find uh, international documents they made international agreements that are um, are always uh, not respected 
those who have more powerful, those who have more power and who can make more profit continue to make power and continue to increase their power and make their profit. So this is something that should be stopped. Uh, and we should we should start stopping uh, this firstly speaking out uh, about this. So we are not all the same. We are all on the same boat, but um, different. But I mean, uh, while we are all on the same boat of climate change, there is people who pay more burden of this, and we should uh, we should take this uh, this into account. We live in an unjust world, and to uh, to reduce risk and to fight climate change, we need to tend toward the just world. Toward the just world means first making those more responsible for climate change, accountable for climate change, and accountable for um, stopping what they are doing now and do better in the future. So, thank you very much. I hope that uh, you know, it was a bit of uh, I give a bit of motivation to, to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Giuseppe. Okay, so I'm going to um, invite everybody back on screen now. And uh, anybody in the uh, audience, you're welcome to type in any questions you have into the chat box wherever you're tuning into the stream, um, and we'll, we'll bring those to the panelists. And also, I want to just invite you all, if you have questions for each other after hearing um, these reflections that you can pose to other other people in the room. Um, but maybe just to start off, I just uh, was really interested in the the work that uh, Yasuaki and Osamu are doing with communities in Japan post-disaster. Post and I wanted to maybe ask both of you to reflect on um, some of the things that, that you've heard and you've seen and the stories, um, especially with regards to how, how people um, like navigate this dilemma of maintaining tradition post-disaster. Um, and uh, would, would love to hear any insights you have into the local context there of this dilemma. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, Leeds uh, introduced, uh, gave, gave an introduction. Uh, I was worked for uh, Tohoku, uh, affected area uh, over 10, uh, for, uh, between 10 years after the uh, tsunami. So uh, I, I, I work with uh, students uh, we made a uh, so uh, reconstruction model diorama model uh, for the affected area so uh, making the uh, workshop with local people uh, so the uh, the uh, hundreds of towns uh, were uh, swept away uh, by tsunami, so they cannot see the mm -hmm. uh, the landscape, uh, townscape before tsunami. So the people cannot remind uh, what it was uh, before tsunami. So uh, we made a model and uh, make a workshop, uh, so they collect the uh, place memory. Uh, of the each streets and the each houses, uh, so uh, one week workshop we collect the uh, over thousand of memories uh, on the on the uh, square meter model. So uh, this is uh, the people uh, want uh, uh, people want keep keeping the uh, memories of places, uh, but the. Uh, the uh, ha, uh, landscape, uh, the houses and the roads were uh, uh, totally changed after the reconstruction. So they cannot, uh, they very hard to keep the uh, uh, the life memories uh, of their hometown. So uh, we try to uh, make the uh, database of the uh, people's mind uh, on the model. So so now uh, so after disaster uh, we we cannot uh, 
avoid the uh, big change of the uh, townscape. But uh, uh, I I found the uh, so we but we can keep the uh, memory uh, on the each uh, people's mind. So so the mod model model uh, workshop is the one. Uh, uh, one way to uh, keep the the, the uh, so they live in a new uh, reconstructed town, but they keep the uh, the old memories uh, on the uh, overlapped. So now we are trying to uh, make the new uh, relationship with the uh, past and future. So uh, now we try to make the new uh, workshop to uh, make keeping the uh, the old memory to into the new uh, structure of the town. So this is the uh, tradition and innovation. So now we, we are working for the this uh, kind of uh, theme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as uh, Tsukihashi-san mentioned, the, the memory is very important. The why important? The, the memory might be, how can I say, the kind of, you know, uh, key of unite of the community. So mm -hmm. community is not existing, the, how can I say, freely. The, the community needs a kind of, you know, symbol to gather the people. So. That's why the memory or history is very important. So, the, according to our study, the, there are, uh, I, we we did a sort of a study the, the, to to check the community, the strong community and the weak community. The strong means uh, recover so rapidly. They start they started uh, uh, the their festival very soon, and the weak community is. Uh, that it's very tough for them to uh, to restart restart their their own festival. The difference is the 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 villages the with strong leader may look strong, however they are weak. The because once the leader had uh, uh, received uh, that kind of damage, the this the the village the the system of this village is very difficult to recover but on the other hand the villages with mutually supported social structure such as a neighborhood association fishing cooperative and uh, festival committees are more resilient so that the, this kind of you know or the social layer uh, should be a kind of you know key of resilience i think Th this is a that that's a simple assumption from our survey. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just jump in here. Um, so thank you very much for everybody's comments. I think the um, Osama's uh, note that we need to train our imagination, mm -hmm. I think is a really key thread and, and very, uh, very important point and also avoiding the simple dualism. So we have to think, maybe we need to think of a, of a way how change and, and tradition are happening together, I think is the struggle that we're all um, um, facing. And then uh, as Giuseppe pointed out, fundamentally it's a justice challenge. So I think there's some really interesting threads that um, are coming up. And I, I wanted to follow up on both of the projects that the from Japan, the last homes projects, I was so impressed with that project. And at that time when it was starting, I was a student at Kobe University. And then the first time I heard, to be honest, the first time I heard about it, I was very skeptical. I was like, oh, architecture students are building models, just white boxes of the towns that we used to be there. That's a very weird thing. But then I joined the project um, with the students and 
uh, with the residents and it's very moving and meaningful activity for the residents to gather around and to talk about what their memories were and to paint the colors of what the houses were and I was I'm so impressed with that project in terms of how it brings together really what architects can do and what architecture students can do which is build models <laughs> and connect with people's memory very simple um, <laughs> but 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 I think it's it's very a design simple. design thinking the simple solution is a is a good solution so i think the and then the 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 comments about the community i think also tie in with with what giuseppe was talking about also in terms of um justice and why are certain people vulnerable and what we need to be thinking more deeply not at the time of disaster so i'm thinking about you know who my question to throw back the question to all of the panelists when we decide, when we talk about what need, needs to change, what tradition we want to keep, what, how we want to move forward, it's really about who's making that decision, I guess. So is it us as an expert? Is it the, who is, in, who is empowered to make that decision? Who is in power and making the decision? And I think we're all thinking about how the residents can be maybe more, uh, more empowered and, and put forward in the process of reconstruction. So I'm wondering if any of our uh, panelists would have any thoughts about that, um, who's making the decision and, and how maybe it could be more local, locally promoted? Uh, I can say something, I don't know if, um, actually I also see there is, a, there is a question in the chat that might be probably might provide a, a similar answer to this question, but anyway, uh, for, well, what I didn't mention was that I believe that w one of the solutions, better one of the approaches, is to uh, you know to involve those who those who, for example, are affected by a disaster or uh, are the most vulnerable to find which can be. Uh, what can I say, to design the project around which their problems can be solved. So very often, as uh, Hunger is saying, um, you know, several DRR projects and those international organizations provide funds, money, projects that are designed externally to the context where they should be uh, implemented. This cause the fact that persons that don't know the context or very often just know the surface of the context, go there and say with their uh, uh, attitude of experts, like almost like uh, also us as academics sometimes do, we say, okay, we know what can be the solution for you. We offer you this package to solve your problems. But at the end, because it's externally designed, there are a lot of nuances, there are a lot, uh, not just of nuances, but also of uh, very important issues that are absolutely not considered. So when you go there, when you go in this place to implement a DRR solution, this solution might not work at all. First, because probably it's a solution that just look at, at one specific aspect of disaster risk, while there are other aspects that are overlooked. Or on the other side, because those who are affected by a disaster or are considered at risk don't accept this solution. So. For sure, there should be a way to include the local level or the community, which you know we are. We know that uh, you, we know um, what are the issues of using this kind of words. But anyway, just to just to let the pub, uh, let our um, our audience, audience understand, we should include the local level in the decision making, but strongly involving them in the decision making. Not just in the, you know, okay, we have a project, tell, tell us what you think, <clears throat> but designing the project, asking for the money, uh, you know, including, let's say, the, at the most possible level, those who mainly suffer from, from disaster or live at risk. For sure, this is a solution because this decreases the potential for uh, uh, this project to make profit just for. Uh, you know, for the international organization, for those who want to make huge profits. So, yeah, this can be one of the uh, approaches, I would say solutions, but one of the way to conceptualize uh, an innovative TRR, even though I don't like the word innovation, because very often we, 
you know, we, we label something innovative, but we also know the, we just know the receipt. We just, just need to uh, implement it. So thank you very much. Yeah, so Akir Osama, do you have uh, any thoughts about this political aspect of reconstruction? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree with uh, Giuseppe's comment. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I I was a person, I was involved at, how can I say, decision making of uh, deconstruction work. So um, it's very difficult, you know. So but maybe the, as uh, Joseph pointed out uh, 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 us, the, the kind of, you know, enforcement system the before the disaster, the, 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 we had better to set up set up the court sort of you know enforcement system before the disaster is a very important thing i i believe so after disaster the the, the so many things happen so it's very difficult to you know to make a light decision the so th th that's why we have better to set up uh, in the, the before the disaster, I think. I think uh, the, uh, the political de decision, uh, well, the, in the case of the uh, uh, big disaster and uh, uh, requirement, quick recovery uh, is a widely area. Uh, it, it's very uh, important to quick decision of the political power. Uh, but uh, uh, in long term, in the case of long term change and uh, adjustment for climate change, uh, so oh, how uh, we how can we share the uh, the uh, problem and uh, challenge uh, for on, on in this area? So. Uh, the uh, long-term uh, resilient design is uh, it, it would be a long-term uh, challenge so uh, i need to i, I think uh, we need to uh, understand that uh, this the, each area uh, is the the normal people and the specialist and the politician uh, how can they share the uh, the asset of, of the uh, this challenge. So uh, I, I, I suppose that uh, using model and uh, it's very simple workshop. It's very easy. Uh, every every uh, child and uh, every student and uh, every uh, specialist, uh, as a normal people, uh, we can share the uh, the knowledge of the places. So uh, it would. Uh, the, in the future, it would be it would make the uh, some funding uh, chance or uh, some uh, the value of the uh, making resilient society. I I, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. So the the important thing the and the uh, we have pay much attention thing is that the after disaster time compression happened as uh, uh, Olshansky was saying. So under time compression, it's very difficult, you know, to gather the, a lot of, you know, stakeholders to lead a light decision, as uh, Osamu mentioned to us, you know, the, to see the long future. So just, uh, you know, under time compression situation, people just focusing just seeking, uh, how can I say, short term the the goals. So that's a the, how can I say, big problem. So th that's why I I told you you guys uh, maybe before the disaster happened, uh, we have better to discuss the the, the the same issues. So then that that sort of you know ground the created. So after that we can decide we can discuss about such kind of thing. And also the reason that tsukihashi sans approach is very important is that the people, they never, how can I say, talking with a, a direct solution. 
the first the people talking with the their own memories it's a very important so after that people is how can i say understanding what's the value of the city what's the value of you know lost the village is so the tsukihashi san's uh, approach is very clever they're very effective don't not, not indirect however it's very how can i say useful i think thank you <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> This has been really great, everybody. Um, we really appreciate all of your reflections. Um, and I'm sure that uh, some of the audience would like to continue this conversation and maybe, maybe reach out. Um, and indeed, we hope to have more of these discussions in person next year in Japan. Um, but for now, thank you, Yasuaki Osamu and Giuseppe, for your reflections. Um, we are now going to transition to the competition results, which yeah. you all have been involved in judging. Um, and for that, Liz is going to take the lead in um, the next section of our live stream. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Jason. And I can, yeah, just thanks also um, from me to all the participants. And um, yeah, this is a taste of learning from Japan. I think there's so much more that we have to share. So we're looking forward to seeing you. And hopefully, um, Yasuaki's book will be available in English maybe by the next IREC in Japan. That would be awesome. And I think it's actually the, the conversation is a really nice segue into the student um, work as well, because now we're, we're talking about the ideas of time and different phases of disasters and kind of closing the link between DRR and reconstruction and long term thinking. And I think that's one of the things that was really um, great uh, in the in the student competition work. So um, First of all, let me just say, uh, let's see. So first of all, I want to thank, before anything else, thank the members of the jury. I'm here because I'm the moderator, but I was only a small part of this, but really um, huge thanks to our, our judges for the student competition. As has already been mentioned, it was not easy because we had great, great submissions. So our, our judges on the, for, the jury, for the student competition jury included Bed Wisner, Ali Ascari, Monia Del Pinto, Osamu Tsukihashi, and Yasuaki Onoda, and myself. And uh, you already met some of them. And I also want to give a special thanks to Monia, who really um, pulled her weight and then uh, by 200% in organizing and pulling together the logistics and also um, helping prepare the information, which I am about to share with all of you. So, um, to give a little bit of a report of what was discussed and what what it what's it all about so as you've heard before the the theme of the competition was tradition between tradition and innovation what must change and what mustn't in the face of disasters and climate change and the competition addressed the theme of change including physical social cultural that is associated with disruption or disaster or displacement and change can manifest and be interpreted in many ways as disrupt disruption of rapid urbanization, subversion, replacing the unquestioned advance for the traditional or adaptation, especially related to climate change. And so students were asked to reflect on the notion of change, considering values and risks associated with it, adopting an ethical perspective. So not a small ask at all, um, with the aim to reduce vulnerabilities and disaster risk in their own cities, countries, territories, they were invited to consider several core questions, including what can and must change, what must and can be maintained and preserved, what can and must be reintroduced that was forgotten, and what is important to consider traditions. And they responded to this call in multiple ways, in interpreting the change as innovation and in design, ideating product products responding to the needs induced by climate change, reconsidering and negotiating the role of tradition and innovation in architecture, integrating traditional building techniques, heritage, not only architectural, but also cultural heritage and innovation. And they responded to context specific threats and they also restored the dialogue with landscape and the local eco ecosystems and planning. So we saw a huge range of product projects that really thoughtfully engaged in the themes in, in a lot of exciting ways, um, especially we saw some, some product design uh, work as well as um, multiple scale work of, of, all, of all kinds. And the competition included a total of 25 entries from Japan, Iran, Canada, Italy, Colombia, Peru, 
and Bangladesh. And the projects ranged from product design, architecture, urban and territorial planning, and often including a multi-scalar approach, which was really appreciated and um, uh, very uh, compelling. They had really great, unique and interesting ideas and covered a range of complex, complex challenges, which made it really difficult for us, as has been mentioned. So um, we, we've come up with a selection of our, the, you know, our, top, our top winners, but that was because we had to. There were a lot of great, great, great projects. So we really compliment all of the, all of the entrants and all of the students for the great work that they did. And we especially appreciated the variety of the proposals and the wide breadth of the ways that the students approached the issues and engaged with them. And for some of the kind of emerging strong themes that we saw throughout the entries, um, one was related to landscape and ecology. And then we, have, we saw a really um, great emphasis and really careful thinking about these kind of these topics and the integration and weaving the ecology into the design and planning, including the building scale, um, unit scale, and settlement scale, and master planning scales. And within the buildings and thinking about ecological approaches, we saw innovative examples of rainwater collection and management through natural drainage. In planning, we saw the adaption, adoption of landscape master planning um, using vegetation as a natural infrastructure. We saw landscape rest restoration using plants as natural mitigation methods against coastal erosion. And many projects also proposed a multi-scalar approach integrating their principles from macro to micro scale across the different scales. Another theme that emerged very strongly was sustainability through reuse and material life cycles. So from the reuse of plastic bottles and containers in wearable floating devices and in building floating platforms, we also saw the use of locally sourced timber or bamboo for emergency shelters in urban and rural areas. And we observed a strong presence of and sensibility to the themes of re reuse, attention to the lifestyle of chosen materials and sustainable sourcing based on seasonality and also the local context. And we also saw a theme of response through capacities. So there were a large number of projects that aimed at strengthening the capacities, which we really appreciated. And this included the individual capacity of self-protection, such as floating devices or the creation of new landmarks, punctuating urban spaces with recognizable elements for dual use that can be used in the everyday and also in the emergency time, and creating and consolidating a pool of knowledge by proposing self-built housing units so that the end users are independent from external aid. We also saw a great uh, strength in attention to traditional building technologies and heritage presence. So a large number of the architectural projects showed the consideration of regional and traditional buildings in various ways, including preserving spatial layout and configuration of the settlement and uh, community living scale, the layout of the local housing typologies, and integrating traditional building techniques and along with advanced solutions and, and reimagining of these um, traditional uh, techniques into more contemporary uses. We also saw in the incorporation of local knowledge and cultural practices in the strategies for settlement developments and resilient resilience building. So we were um, looking at these amazing um, tsunami of wonderful projects. The, the criteria that we used um, that was taken from the call for submissions was they were evaluated based on the context. So including an examination of the context and consideration of traditional forms and patterns of living in the local place and the technological aspects. So how they approach the issues of partial or total reconstruction, uh, exploration of housing solutions from the point of view of the settlement, especially in the village scale, um, their assessment of traditional advanced technologies and how they saw these trade-offs um, such as costs, et cetera. And the next uh, topic was the organizational approach and logistics. And this was um, the consideration of organizational design. So how they the design the project and who, what, which kind of partners would they be working with and how the implementation would be carried out and um, considering the impact on recovery and reconstruction and also on local identity. So considering the local and external resources and the coordination of them and consideration of stakeholders and thinking through who's gonna be um, involved in carrying out this kind of project. And that was a really um, impressive 
thing to see people considering. Um, we also looked considered ethics, so how the ethic, how the projects that are proposed um, are an ethical approach to um, supporting folks in in the situation, and COVID nineteen also in in case of uh, projects that considered the mutated use of space and technology and how um, our way of living has changed with the pandemic and the new modes of social interaction that go along with that as as COVID could also be, of course, um, impacting on top of other kind of hazard events. And finally, the clarity and effectiveness of design and presentation, both of the proposed design and of the materials of uh, the, the proposal materials themselves and legibility and clarity of diagrams and um, the design of the of the submissions. And we were also very impressed with the level of uh, high level of design and uh, beautiful work that we saw. So of all of these great projects, the strongest projects shared several aspects. They showed a deep understanding of local, regional, and cultural contexts with key information presented clearly and a good balance between the key overall points along with local specific information. Um, so they showed clear thinking at multiple scales, the level of the individual house, household, settlement, regional, ecosystem, um, and integrated these different layers together into a, a cohesive proposal. They had carefully considered not only the design of individual units, but also the multiple organizations at the scale of the settlement and implications for residents. And they had clear ideas, but also options for variation and flexibility, such as different combinations, expansion, configuration, multiplication. So we saw really a lot of, um, we talked about imagination training before. So I think we already saw a lot of great imagine, imagination um, at work in, in not only presenting a project, a static project, but the projects were really, um, they had built in uh, evolution and change and, uh, modification that was that was already uh, part of the proposals. Um, they also balanced the features of practicality and creativity, and they considered that they considered and answered all of these or, or many of these various issues that they were asked in the brief, which is not a small feat, including the questions of materials, uh, traditions, organizational arrangements, and implementation over time. So let's see. Um, without further ado, I would like to start announcing the winners. I, can I just do that? I think I have the, I have the floor. So, um, first of all, drum roll, um, I would like to announce our honorable mention. So our honorable, honorable excuse me, here it is. Our honorable mention went to a project called Reconstruzione Possisma del Contro Storico di Amatrice, la Multidimensionalità del for, della Forma. So this proposal is an impressive consideration of the historic post-earthquake reconstruction of Amatrice in Italy, including a strong conceptual and theoretical framework, as well as a detailed exploration of space and time. We, um, so we, because we maybe were a little bit limited in the fact that not all of us could understand Italian. And so this, this is our honorable mention, so it didn't win our top prizes, but we really felt that the designers deserve huge compliments and congratulations on the work that they put into this project and the way they engage in this topic in such a deep and meaningful way and a unique way as well, focusing on reconstruction. So it was very, um, sophisticated, focusing on physical and temporal dimensions of post-earthquake -er urban reconstruction and centering both on heritage values and social aspects of the place and transformation over time, starting from the most recent earthquake. So yeah, we really appreciated the multi-layered consideration of reconstruction and backed up by a network of stakeholders mediated by space and changing in time and accurately pondered intervention of the open spaces retaining value for the community. So congratulations to this uh, designer. So next, I would like to announce the third prize, which is the Floating Funaya. So this is a project um, from Japan, and this project is activating the local heritage in disaster response by using, using funayas, the traditional structures that integrate boat storage and living units facing the sea. 
Um, this proposal aims at building capacities by incorporating in the everyday use of community and tourists the structures of the funeas. And in disaster response, they become temporary floating shelters in case of earthquake or typhoon event. So the jury appreciated how the heritage was mobilized by this project and turning an inherently fragile element into a resource and also the innovative proposal to make a shift in thinking that is this, about the sea, which is a traditional festival venue, is regarded as a stable and safe emergency evacuation destination. And it can provide, provide a solution to certain emergencies and could be life-saving method under certain conditions. So, um, and this was also a beautiful proposal and uh, very creative and unique. So wonderful thing to see in a design competition and congratulations to the designer. Sir designers. So for our second prize, we selected the project um, entitled Self-Sustaining Cyclone Resilient Building. And this project works at multiple scales, providing a flexible model accounting for the physical and natural and social aspects in the context. At the territorial scale, it provides a landscape master plan that goes beyond the mere land partition. At the settlement scale, it proposes variations in neighborhood layout responding to different activities of the residents. At the building scale, the design is developed from the traditional home spaces to be self-built, and so it doesn't impose a building pro program or material to users. So the jury appreciated the settlement design showing total consideration for the process of restoration before and after the disaster, as well as the consideration of economic feasibility. We also valued the variety and flexibility of options that were worked out with multiple solutions and the balance between the various, various scales. So I think this project really, it ticked all the boxes in terms of addressing the things that we had been um, asked, that the de designers had been asked to address from design to settlement to organization structure and into a really um, a practical and useful and thoughtful solution um, that would really help the affected residents. So finally, that brings me to our final number one first prize. And the first prize for the 200, uh, 2022 IREC Student Design Competition goes to a project entitled Resilience and Autosufficience pour l'île de Manpura. And this is a simple and creative proposal for flood response and mitigation in Manpura region in Bangladesh, based on the use of vegetation to minimize coastal erosion and on retrofit of the traditional neighborhoods to enhance flood resilience. The non-invasive design interventions provide the housing units with floating basements and floating courtyards, combining reuse containers and locally sourced bamboo. This project is made to be self-built with the initial support of NGOs. And the jury appreciated that the design clearly communicated the context, key issues, and strategies at the scale of the individual house as well as the settlement, and as well as along a seasonal timeline. We also value the creative approach to the combination of traditional materials and construction in bamboo housing and settlement that can respond and adapt to flood conditions. The project is a low cost and feasible solution to housing for people impacted by cyclones while giving proper attention to the cultural and gender needs and dimensions of the housing. And while respecting the materials and traditional housing style of the area, the living space included not only the floating house, but also the floating courtyard and is beautifully designed. So we also were very impressed with this project in its, um, I would say balance of practicality simplicity, innovation, um, and including especially the, the local materials and the, the floating aspect and the village aspect. So we really thought this, this project embodied the, um, the ask of the brief. So congratulations to the first prize winner and congratulations again to all of the designers who submitted works. And please, if you haven't checked out the, uh, the website of the design competition, you can see um, you, saw, you saw a little glimpse of the projects, but you can see the full um, submission for, for all of the projects that were submitted. And um, again, I would just like to also say we appreciated all of the, the variety of the projects that were submitted. So we also had some product design that in the end weren't selected as our top reconstruction projects, but we also really appreciated seeing those projects and that way of thinking about um, expanding what what is relevant in disasters. And also there were a couple projects who um, weren't selected because they were uh, a little bit longer than, than the requirement, but they were also very beautiful and a lot of work went into all of them. So I would encourage everyone to um, check out the website and all of these 
uh, great projects and we definitely felt really inspired and motivated about the future generations and how they're thinking about uh, resilience in, in new and exciting ways. And I would like to thank again, um, all the jury members. Um, thank you very much. Thanks Liz for um, taking us through that and announcing the winners and congratulations to all. And um, we are coming towards the end, but I have a surprise for you all because we have a, a member of the jury um, who doesn't need a lot of introduction um, for you all with us, Ben Wisner, um, co-founder of Radix Network and um, someone who will be very familiar to um, everybody at IREC. So Ben, thanks for joining us. And I wanted to just allow you to have the opportunity to wrap us up really and maybe co comment on um, the topic, but also on like the way that IREC brings students into the conversation through these uh, competitions and, um, and on the importance of that. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a bit of a surprise for me too. Um, uh, <clears throat> I um, I was uh, only able to um, participate in um, in in studying and then ranking the uh, the the last five of the submissions because uh, alas uh, I uh, I fell over um, um, three weeks ago and and bumped my head and and actually suffered a concussion. So uh, indeed, I'm I'm still um, a little bit numb and vague. So if nothing I say makes any sense, uh, uh, you can you can blame my brain. Um, I I was very impressed. Um, I mean, I I did I did look at, um, at 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 the full twenty five at one point. It's certainly skimming them, but then I really was only able to apply. Um, apply myself to the to the five that were shortlisted. Um, I, I was very impressed um, by the, the the submissions and my congratulations to uh, to to all the all the students and uh, and the people who submitted these proposals. Um, I I found I I, I suppose. What I found um, somewhat troubling at first um, was the was was the fact that um, people generally weren't taking power relationships into account. Now, um, uh, in the course of of um, the the webinar today i'm beginning to see that perhaps i'm i was a little too hasty in 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 drawing that judgment but i i'd like to underline the the importance of <clears throat> interrogating um both tradition and innovation from the point of view of um as as uh, giuseppe uh pointed out and i think as as liz uh, also um reinforced uh, the, the 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 just the question of just who 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 has the power to decide who who lays out the context that uh, that uh, that des that describes and delimits common sense what's the universe of discourse who who actually defines that universe of discourse so that I think both tradition and innovation actually can be um, defined in ways that reinforce uh, the power of, 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 of entities and individuals, um, groups of innovation, of, of, of individuals that, um, that, that oppress and exploit other people. Um, uh, for those of you who, who know my, my work over the years and, and, and interventions at various points, you probably aren't surprised that I'm Yet again, um, beating beating the drum, um, and um, and and um, and emphasizing um, social, political, institutional, and economic power. Um, 
and uh, I, I I do that unapologetically. Um, it's it's very important, and uh, and indeed in re in relation to um, the um, climate crisis we're facing now, uh, we you know, will see more and more uh, efforts to uh, define the universe of discourse in ways that <clears throat> uh, either provide those with power um, with excuses or, 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 or come up with solutions, uh, solutions uh, that, that um, uh, are really only lip service. So uh, the struggle has to continue. Uh, as Giuseppe said, the beginning of the struggle and the uh, foundation of it is uh, to, to, to call out power, to name power, to speak truth to power. Uh, that's not the only uh, tool or lever that uh, we have, but it's certainly an important starting point, as uh, Giuseppe said. Um, again, my congratulations. Uh, uh, you wanted me to uh, comment a bit on on Iraq itself. Um, I just was uh, very impressed with the way in which um, the competition was run and the um, the uh, the diversity of submissions uh, which also is a function of the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 spread and the and the diffusion of the uh, of the call and um, um, <clears throat> Um, Liz um, reviewed the uh, uh, countries from which uh, submissions came, and it's quite a diverse and interesting uh, uh, subset uh, of, of humanity. So, so my congratulations to Iraq, to uh, Iraq for um, uh, that that ability to 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 get the word out and to draw in submissions from such a diversity of um, of places. I think that's about all I have to contribute at this point. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ben. And we're happy to see you healthy and keep keep getting healthier and take care of your noggin because we need it. <laughs> <in this work. laughs> um, thank you so much. And I also want to thank, um, I realize I was very amiss to uh, thank Gonzalo especially and Mauro for all of the work that they put together, mm -hmm. uh, putting together the, the, putting together the condition, the competition and organizing the call and making the website and not just this year, but this is the 10th time that they've been doing that. So I think they're, you know, Gonzalo is, is key to organize, to keeping, it's all linking up, right? It's the student competition and IREC itself. And so thank you also to Gonzalo and um, also to Ben. So yeah, and thank you to everybody. Yeah, and I just, as we, as we wrap up here, um, thanks again, Ben, for joining us briefly. Mm -hmm. And as we wrap up here, I just wanted to thank you, Liz, for, for co-hosting with me today. Um, it's been a really incredible session and I've learned a lot. And um, just to everybody out there, we do have our next season, season seven, coming up soon, um, next month. July's almost here, eh? Um, and so please join us for season seven. It's gonna be super exciting. If you've been following, we announced um, some books that we would like you all to read in season seven um and so get reading so you can join the discussion um thanks again to all our guests today osamu yasuaki and giuseppe and ben thanks to monia for being really integral to the competition um and gonzalo everybody at irec we love you a lot and we'll see you all in person next year bye everybody thank you